Alrighty. Well, we'll make a start. Um, thanks for coming tonight, firstly. My name's Matt Pollard uh, and me, Jack Evangelo, we're going to be presenting a little bit later. Um, well, at least we're going to be presenting later, I'm presenting straight up. Thanks, thanks for coming. We're, tonight we're talking about strength and movement training for golfers and essentially um, what we at Rice Health Group and Rice High Performance can do and currently do and have been doing for years to help golfers. So, as I said, welcome. The presenters tonight are both myself and Lee uh, to give you, to introduce ourselves essentially. I'm an accredited exercise physiologist, which means I've spent four and a half years at university doing a bachelor's and a master's degree studying just exercise. Um, I'm the manager of exercise services here with Rice Health Group and Rice Health Performance. Um, I'm also a casual academic at Deakin University, so I also teach into their undergraduate unit uh, at their bachelor of exercises full times as well. So, that's me. Um, Lee Yakovangelo is a physiotherapist and is our manager of clinical services. He's done a bachelor of physiotherapy and he's a grad student in sports physiotherapy currently. Um, he also is currently working with and has in the past as well the Australian indoor hockey team as their physiotherapist. So that's us. You'll notice out there that on none of these spots it says golf coach or incredibly good golfer. <laughs> so just because we talk about and understand the movement science behind golf doesn't mean we can do it, they're two different things. So essentially if you want a little bit of the history, when we started working with the school and people like Tim Wendell who's the head golf coach with the school, we sort of uh, worked together from completely opposite angles to come to pretty much the same destination most of the time. It's funny how when we talk to him and we say well, we're seeing this in the way they move and he goes yeah well this is what I'm seeing in the swing as well and how those two things come together. So. The way I talk about it is basically our job is to allow your golf coach to actually teach you how to swing, how to swing the stick. So you can't you can't hide faulty movement within your golf swing. Your body's going to alter its movement based on where it feels comfortable. We'll talk about it a little bit more. Later. So essentially, the topics we're going to talk about is exercise science and golf. Now, the word science and golf, you'll get about sixteen billion entries if you type that into into Google. Um, I'm just going to touch on it briefly, I suppose. And we're going to talk about movement and strength training when we can go in the gym and um, have a bit of a practical. So we can go through a few exercises, just a couple of the exercises that we, we would do with, with a golfing athlete. Um, I'm going to introduce the, the sport and the swing briefly, I suppose, before I get into the exercise science thing. And the, the tack I'm going to take tonight is more around um, talking about the myths that surround golf, one thing that drives me crazy is if you even watch the coverage of golf and you see them talking about someone like Rory McIlroy and oh, and he's back sore because he lifts weights. Well, it's just, it, it's, it can't be the case and I'll explain why as we go. So a little bit of an introduction. There's approximately 55 to 80 million players across 136 countries in the world. So golf is really well widely played. The beautiful thing about golf is whether you're playing for recreation or you're playing it for a job, the goals are pretty much the same. Have as few shots as possible, which I seem to struggle lightly with, and remain injury free. Yeah, that's the beauty of it. So we can have this. And, and the things we're going to talk about tonight are relevant whether you just have a hit once a month or whether you're playing six, seven, eight, nine times a week and you're like the other complexity when you look at golf is the average round takes between three and a half and six hours to play 18 holes. So if you look at that in isolation, you go, okay, it's an endurance based sport. I mean, consider a tournament as well, like practice rounds, you might have eight, uh, six days straight, say, of six hours a day on the course, not including warm up time and, and time to get off the course. 60% of that time is spent preparing or, or taking a swing, 25% of that time is spent putting. So when you look at that and say, okay, it's an endurance based sport, but then you come down here and you go, we need to make that golf club head reach speeds of over 160 kilometers an hour, okay, maybe it's a power sport. And you've got this nice little mix of both ends of the spectrum. Basically, you can't be purely, in, you can't be a total endurance and power athlete, they're completely opposites. So the fun in training a golfer, I suppose, is you've got to consider completely both ends. You've got to, you've got to make them an all round athlete, otherwise you're leaving things off. So I'm not going to go into this in massive details, but like I said, I'm not a golf coach, but when it comes to looking at the movement that the golf swing is, there's a massive element of obviously rotary power, the ability to generate force through rotation, which we don't do very well. Probably the big thing for me is I've gotten interested in golf and I spend more time working with golfers or, or even watching golf on the TV, is every single athlete I see seems to do that differently, regardless of the level. Where 
As golfers, we're not great at generating rotary power, yet we've got to come from here and somehow hit the ball that way well. So if we can't generate force through rotation, we can't hit the ball well. Force generation happens through all three planes of motion. So I talked about we need to be able to, to rotate to hit the ball, but at the same time there's a weight shift from your back to your front foot as you follow through. There's also direct transfer, which I'll talk about, in how much force you can produce this way, and how far you're going to hit the ball that way. So all three planes are covered, and that's where it becomes really complicated. You think about the moment R basically is, is the distance of the club head from the center of mass, or the center of gravity. That's going to change for every single person that's different. That's going to change when you change clubs. We talked about the club head speed re reaching 160 kilometers an hour. There's something called the speed accuracy trade-off, which basically, the faster you choose to move, the less accurate you're going to be. The more accurate you choose to be, the harder it is to move fast. Yet again, we're going to move that club head so fast, hit this little tiny ball, 300 meters that way, it, it's an incredibly complicated thing. So there's no, this is why when you type in golf biomechanics into Google, you get six billion hits. That's a made up stat, by the way. So I said I'm going to start talking about me, I'm going to start covering a lot of the myths. So to get better at hitting golf balls, I just need to hit more golf balls. This is probably the big thing. When we work with golfers that take their golf balls seriously, the amount of golf balls they hit is out of control. So I'm just going to give you a couple of fun facts here. They're probably a little bit off topic for what we're going to do later when it comes to movement, but just to give you some take home points today as well. So this, this here, if you think about hitting balls at a driving range, that's what we would call block practice. That's putting a ball on the ground, nothing changes, we hit a golf ball. We grab another ball, we put it in the same spot, we hit another golf ball. We do the same thing over and over again. It's blocked practice, nothing changes. But when you consider golf as a sport, it's actually quite random. You hit a ball, and then you go walk up to a completely different slope, grab a different club, and hit a different way. It's quite random in nature. Basically, this was a, a, a study done in 1979, with the original, and it's been followed up with a heap of different skills since. But what they looked at is, if you practice in a blocked format, whether that would transfer to either blocked or random um, skill retentions. So what's confusing here is this was just a series of lights and they had to touch whatever light flashed up. And the longer it took them to touch the light, obviously the longer time they got. So being higher up on this graph is actually worse. So when the lights went off at random intervals and random lights went off, and that was the way that they practiced, this was the, this was the, the skill acquisition phase or the training phase. So this is your training. So block practice, would be sitting at the driving range, hitting six billion balls with the same club over and over again. You can see that their, their performance improves ever so slightly. When it was random, and you practice with different clubs from different angles and different orientations, we actually improved our skills quite dramatically. But, we go down the end here, it gets quite confusing. So that's, that's blocked uh, practice into random retention. You can see how that skill drops off. So how many of us have spent time at the driving range and gone, I'm flushing it, I'm hitting the ball so good right now. You go out onto the golf course, you hit the first one nice and then you, you, you don't hit any good after that. Yeah, that's because you've gone from that block format where you're doing the same thing over and over again to a random format, which you haven't actually practiced. And so you can see there that massive drop off in performance. But when you've got random here into a random environment, the performance is actually as good as if you were blocked practice into blocked retention, if that makes sense. So basically, just as an element to think about, if you're going to go to the driving range, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but if you're going to hit the same club and the same shot 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 times in a row, there's not going to be a lot of transfer for your performance. Make sense? Now, this is the other little take home message that you can go out on a golf course tomorrow and try. So this is looking at internal cueing versus external cueing versus no cue skills. So basically this was again the original study and they followed it up with other skills since then. So things like shooting a basketball, hitting a golf ball, all those sorts of things. This is the performance if, you, they given, if the athletes are given no cues whatsoever. So the dark blue is males, the lighter blue is females. And there's their jump heights. Now if you gave them something external to focus on, so if you said I want you to go and touch that roof up there, go get it, jump as high as you can, touch that roof. Both groups, their performance improved. But when you made that athlete focus within themselves, and this traditionally in the exercise world is us saying squeeze your glutes, draw your tummy, and those sorts of things, the actual performance outcome got worse. So like I said, they followed this up with studies in golf, 
where they have the person just concentrate, hit that ball long and straight for me. And I actually do a better job of hitting the ball long and straight than if we're concentrating on our front arm or where we're holding our weight or where we're shifting. Now in terms of training and learning a skill, there may be time for that. But if you're performing, if you're out on the golf course and you're thinking about where your weight is or where you're holding the club or what you're doing with your front elbow, your performance is going to be worse than if you just concentrate on hitting the ball hard. The perfect story happened this is actually my background is in basketball. I had an athlete who missed about six free throws in a row. All of them were short, so he hit the front of the rim. And I went up to him and I said, how have you missed every shot so far? He said, oh, my elbow wasn't that good. I said, no, nah, they were all short. They were hit the front of the rim. I said, what do you think you should do? And he goes, tuck my elbow in. And I said, no, just shoot it a little bit further. <laughs> and he did, and the next one went in. But it's amazing how we get like that, because we get so technical in ourselves. I need to have this here, and, and we, we learn the skill so in, in depth. But actually just thinking externally, and just thinking about it in a basic manner, hit the ball straight, will actually improve our performance. To get better at hitting a golf ball, I just need to hit more golf balls. Further to that, most injuries in golf are actually overused. The sport is incredibly one-sided. You rotate, you do rotate into your backswing, but when you actually follow through, you don't get a lot of rotation through your trunk. Most of it actually comes through your hips. So the sport itself is fairly one-sided. So if you do the same thing over and over again, you're actually predisposing yourself to injury. And this study looked at this, and they said most, most of the injuries can be prevented by a year-round sport-specific strength conditioning program, which is convenient for me, and a short program <laughs> one, which again is what we do. And their last point was an adjustment of golf swing. Most golfers jump to this first. Oh, I need to get a golf coach. But two out of those three things, maybe a golf coach can do, but comes back to having your body prepared to play the sport, or to undo the imbalances created by the sport. To get better at golf, I just need to strengthen my core. This is another one, so people will spend an eternity doing planks and sit-ups and side planks, and oh, I've got the strongest core in the world, I'm gonna be a good golfer. That's nice in theory, I don't disagree. The core is really important in, in being a good golfer. But the research shows that if you jump high, you hit the ball further. So, it, which we would use in terms of an assessment as a, a basic assessment to look at the power you release in general. Okay, of course, going to be a factor with very little. And if you look at long drive athletes in the States go around and just go have to your more style, look how far and hit the ball, they have a vertical jump of approximately 30 inches. That's, at, that's about 8 inches higher than the average PGA player. So, if all they do is hit the ball far, and they've got a lot of low limb power, um, they're hitting the ball a lot further than the average PGA player. Furthermore, again, they followed up with a study, and sure enough, basically your vertical jump correlates with how far you're going to hit the ball. Yeah? Strength training hurts the back is the fun one, because the research will show the most effective treatment for training, uh, for, for preventing and treating low back pain is actually strength training. So, if strength training is going to hurt your back, the strength training is not being done very well. Major ways to do that is improving movement pattern, improving strength, and improving load tolerance. And improving stability. That the correct um, training? Like, so obviously doing your squat properly rather than... Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if, if strength training is done poorly, you can hurt anything. And we do see quite commonly people will go on a deadlift somewhere and they're going to go, oh, I don't want that deadlift. And when you look at their deadlift technique, it's deplorable. And that's why. You put the body under low positions it doesn't want to be in, it's going to get injured. Yeah? Come back to a deadlift, I'll talk about that. But you're right, that's where appropriate strength training basically is the most effective treatment. I should answer this with pictures. If I do strength training, I'll get big and I'll lose my mobility, flexibility, and I won't be able to hit a golf ball. Tell me more about this guy's mobility over here, who lifts weights for a living. Or this guy over here, he's a pretty big unit. He's struggling with mobility right here. Exactly. We've got a guy that works with us who's the, the second best Olympic lifter in the country, and he's by far the biggest dude in our team, and he's by far the most flexible. So what is mobility? I guess, looking into this a little bit further and going down, we'll talk about what do you, what's actually happening when you feel tight. Does anyone know the difference between mobility and flexibility? Just quickly, question your ears. What's that? Joint. 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 Mm, good try. Essentially, flexibility is how far your joint in isolation can move through range. So, if I can lay you down on your back and I can grab your leg and I can pull your leg all the way up and get yourself in the face, that's your flexibility. But how far can you do that yourself? 
that will be more mobility. Essentially, flexibility is how far can someone else move you? We can completely relax. Mobility is how far can you do it yourself? So, what's happening when you feel tight? I'll talk about this guy, Charlie Weinreich. He's a, 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 funnily enough, he's a mix of lean iron, basically. He's a physio, and strength and conditioning coach, or an exercise physiologist, essentially in the States. He works for the Toronto Raptors, which are an NBA team. He suggests that if you do a proper, well structured strength and conditioning program, you probably don't really need to stretch. Because by having that balance in your movement and strength, the stretching side of things is, is just an extra that you don't even really need. And what is tightness? Tightness, most of the time, it's two things. It's either muscle getting overloaded because it's getting used way too much. And I always use the analogy that if you had, I'll do us again, Lee and I that works for you, and Lee was constantly outside drinking coffee and not doing any work, and so I had to do his work and my work, who's going to complain first, me or Lee? Me, I'm doing twice as much work, yeah? And more often than not, I'm, say, the lower back in a golf swing. People don't have the mobility in their hips, which is weak, he's outside drinking coffee, so the hips don't do as much work as they're supposed to. So then all of a sudden the person moves far more than they have to through their lower back. And at some point, the lower back gets tired of working too hard, it feels tight, and it gets painful. Yeah? And what most people will do is they'll come along and they'll just keep me along and keep encouraging me, massage the back, or, or give the back a stretch, make the back feel better, keep working, man, you're doing well. But in reality, what needs to happen is someone needs to be leading pick up the backside, make him do more work, and then all of a sudden I stop complaining because I'm doing less, he's doing more. Does that make sense? The other thing is a lot of the time with tightness, it's actually just your body putting on the brakes. If your body doesn't feel it can control movement, this is where the idea of stability comes in. If it doesn't feel it can control movement, it'll lock down. So it'll turn a muscle on to stop you. You can practice this when you get home if you like. We practice in the gym, lay a lay flat on your back, get a friend, partner, family member to lift your leg as high as they can. Keep both legs straight and just gently lift it. See how high you can get it. And then try and lift it yourself. And for a lot of us, we won't be able to lift it as high as someone else can. So when we switch off the muscles, the body can actually move a lot further. And to give you the idea of flexibility further, if they put people on, if we put you under an anesthetic, so you're asleep, I could probably get you to scratch your nose and your toe. <laughs> so as soon as I turn the nervous system off, you've actually got the range of motion. It's your body not being used to those sorts of ranges. So when we talk about being tight, appropriate movement and strength training will, will remove that entirely. Which again is one of the most common things you've seen. Golf is tight, all that. All right. This is one of my favourite quotes. I put this in most talks that I ever do. Strength training is coordination based training with increased resistance. Proper strength training, I suppose, again. Strength training is coordination based training. Something that a lot of people can't quite understand, I guess. But if you look at the elements to improving your performance from strength training, essentially, this is strength up here. And these two down here is how much neural adaptation, so basically your nervous system learning, versus hypertrophy muscles getting bigger, basically, is contributing to performance. It's contributing to that strength improvement. And if you look here, your most rapid rate of improvement is actually at the start. And the thing that's actually adapting is your nervous system. So when you strength train, your biggest adaptation, particularly right at the start, is a result of the nervous system learning how to move more efficiently. And doesn't that sound like a wonderfully constructive thing? The other thing is this point here is about the six to eight week mark. If you're doing the same gym program for more than six to eight weeks, you've either been too slack to come back and get a new one, or you need to have a chat to train. Because at that point there, that's when this starts to level off and you're starting to lose the benefits. Yeah, and see this line starts to flatten around a similar point in time. That's generally where we'll give a new program. I know for the RSA athletes, that's generally where Lee's stuck in his office for three hours or only one new program. Yeah, six to eight hours, that's six to eight weeks there. It takes actually about 12 weeks for the adaptations to be taken over by the muscle. So, when it comes to a golfer, I talked about how being huge doesn't necessarily mean you can't move well. But we would spend a lot more time working down here. If we change the program and this whole graph restarts because you've got something new for your body to try and figure out. Does that make sense? So I come back to something I talked about earlier and again another one of my favourite quotes, movement never lies. 
You can try and cheat your way through a good movement assessment, but I guarantee you won't be able to. Movement does not lie. And it's amazing how often when we assess someone's movement, I say, you do this in your golf swing, don't you? And they look at me like I'm some magic man that stalks them on the golf course or something. But the same way you choose to move in a good movement assessment is the same way your body will choose to move under load or velocity. And we'll show you an example, some examples of that when we go into the gym later. But it largely comes back to this graph here, which I love. And this is why I love working with golf. We talked about how complicated it is, how multiplanar it is. You've got all different forces moving in completely different directions and you've got to try and control that. If this isn't perfect, you won't be able to hit a golf ball. So basically every joint can get broken, every joint, every section of the body can get broken down into whether it should be primarily stable. And if you look in the building, this is the big one, everyone always goes, oh, of course, stability. Or mobile. If you change any one point of this, other segments will have to change to compensate. Yeah, it comes back to my analogy of your leg. So if your hips don't move very well, then your back's not going to be stable because your body has to find movement somewhere. That makes sense? So movement efficiency essentially comes back to assuring that all parts of the body move in time and in the right sequence, which again, when you look at the complexity of something like a golf swing, you need movement efficiency. I'm just gonna tell a brief little story about someone in the room here that I won't name. They came to see me with a sore right lower back and they were actually sitting down, we hadn't even stopped yet, I talked about movement not lying, they didn't even get a chance to lie we were sitting down at my desk and wearing shorts and we we're talking about them and I talking about how their right side lower back gets, gets sore and what they need to do in their golf coach to try and fix it. And I noticed they had a big scar on their left knee, right hand golf club. And so I said, what happened to your thing? He said, oh, I had a, an ACL repo when I was much younger. I said, okay, what do you think your ankle range of motion is like? Does it feel stiff? And he goes, yeah, they click all the time actually. They're really quite stiff. I said, particularly left one? He goes, yeah. I said, you hit a golf ball like this, don't you? And he goes, how did you do that? Because basically what happens, he can get into his setup perfect, but then as soon as he adds velocity to that, his body goes, I'm not mobile enough here, I need to get away from that. So I'll do this. And it'll push him away. So as soon as he has that velocity there, his body goes, no, nah, don't shift your weight onto my front foot, move away from me. I'm going to do that. And that's where he did it for. And we fixed his left ankle range of motion, his low back pain and adjust him again. Yeah? I put touched on a deadlift and appropriate deadlifting earlier. I like this just because of the dude doing deadlift on the golf course, it made me happy. But <laughs> most importantly, if you took that kettlebell out of your hand and put a golf club in there, what would it look like? It golf hand. Yeah. So if you're not strong in that position, this is why it's also the same position you're going to do a vertical jump from. It's exactly why if we look at your vertical jump height, that's going to tell me how far you can get a golf ball. Yeah. And lastly for me, I'm just going to take you through briefly an example of an assessment that we've done recently. I've taken the athletes' names out of there, but essentially there's lots of abbreviations on here. One, ones are things we need to fix, threes are exceptional, twos are pass marks. Yeah, so we're happy with twos. Both of these athletes have something we need to, we need to fix down the bottom now. Funnily enough, that RS stands for rotary stability. So if they don't have rotary stability, they don't have anything to go to We need to fix that. Yeah? And then if you come down here, we look at their vertical leap. So we look at their ability to load and explode, which is a counter movement jump. So straight down, straight up. Load the system, explode out, and how much height they can go. This bloke over here, anyone know what the best counter movement jump ever tested the AFL combine is? Pretty good. 85 centimeters. He's just a lazy one centimeter off that. It's not bad going. It's a pretty good jump. It's not like coming here again, golf design athletes. Um, finally, I'll fix the ball a bit of a way. Then we go to this athlete over here. So this movement here, he pauses at the bottom for three seconds before you jump. So he's gonna squat down, he's gonna pause, and then we're gonna generate a force and try and jump from there. Versus straight down, straight up. So this tells me this athlete here has no ability to load and explode the system. And again, in their golf swing, they tend to just muscle their way through that. Yeah. So we need to teach that person to load up and explode out of it. And then further down here, we've got their, their strength measures. Both, you, both you can see a pretty strong, powerful athlete um, can move a fair bit of weight. So this sort of thing you see in the league is their program design. So this guy here is going to work on on that load and explode that ability to absorb force and create it really quickly. Whereas this guy over here is probably going to work more if you look at these numbers here. His strength on two legs compared to strength on one. Which is this? Lots of variations going on there. 
You need to be strong on one leg in golf because as you transition your weight from one side to the other, as I said, if you don't have good, strong single leg strength, then the same thing we talked about in the ankle range of motion is going to happen. It's going to go, I'm really strong over here, I'm not strong here, so I'm going to transition away from that. So if I can make you strong on one leg, it goes even better than what makes you all better. Is there a correlation between the powder weight for a vertical lift? Obviously, yeah. if you're heavy up, yeah. you're not going to lift yourself yeah. to the ground as easily. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Essentially, you're entirely right. You've got a, a big, powerful frame. A big frame, you can't jump very high. But if you can get that body weight behind a golf ball, it's still going to go a long way. Yeah. Any questions for me? No. I'm going to hand over my psyche then. We'll have plenty of time for questions later, too. Thanks, um, So, yeah, Matt introduced me before, but um, yeah, by, from early on, the uh, physio. Uh, for RSA, uh, and I work with the RSA athletes here, um, from the general mission point of view, um, in the gym. Uh, pretty much what I'm going to touch on uh, is rotatory power, uh, the importance of uh, the whole body working together to be able to create a coil, uh, followed by um, a recoil. So we want to coil and we want to uncoil. I'll also talk about uh, core uh, and what is what is core really. Um, so I'll touch on that. So, um, this is uh, Peter Cohen. Uh, he talks about uh, staircase uh, drill. But why I like this is because uh, rotation is generated uh, from the feet uh, working all the way up. So, we work with rotation from the ground up. So, um, and once again, same with Matt, I'm not a golf coach, uh, but I just try and work with movement patterns. Um, it's important when we look at this um, that he coils. So he uh, starts with his feet, he's coiling through his ankles, his knees, uh, coils through his hips, his pelvis, through his thoracic spine, shoulder blade, so really nice shoulder uh, blade mobility through there, as well as uh, his shoulders. And so in that point there, he can actually store energy at the top. So he's coiling all the way up, storing energy, and that ability to uncoil and release energy all the way down. So coming back to a gym uh, sense, it's important when we're in the gym, we do very similar exercises. So whether that's a, a medicine ball rotation exercise or working with resistance band, doing a lot of chip, uh, chops, that ability to uh, coil all the way up, storing energy, uncoil coming down uh, to release energy is absolutely vital. Okay. Um, the other one that I like um, leading on um, from uh, the staircase analogy is uh, a slinky analogy. So I, I brought one in to show you. If you think about um, a golfer as, as a slinky, okay, so a slinky functions best in a, in a compressive manner. Okay? So if you think about an athlete in the gym, a back squat is a compressive exercise or a box jump is a compressive exercise. Now, I can also rotate this slinky with, with no issues, okay? So once again, golfers need to be able to rotate. With this slinky also, I can actually side bend the slinky a little bit as well. And that's what Matt was talking about with the three planes of motion. It's very important that we control the pelvis in our frontal plane as well, okay? So we need good frontal plane control, okay? So we can compress, we can rotate the slinky, and we can side bend. But where a lot of uh, I think golfers get caught out is if we, for example, if we start to laterally flex this slinky, okay, and then add a compressive element, the system collapses. So if you think about, um, uh, for example, uh, going back to golf, if I was to uh, coil in this position, so as I'm rotating up into this position here, if I was to laterally flex like my slinky, now the system and my human body will actually collapse. It will fail, and I haven't been able to actually store energy at the top, and I'm un and not in a position to be able to release energy because as I've come into this position, the system has collapsed, no more energy, and, and we're going to collapse through the opening up injury, but also we're not going to generate any power as well. Okay, so if, if that helps to uh, um, think about the slinky, uh, we want compression, we want rotation, but we don't want to be able to actually place at any stage. Um, I will touch on um, rotatory musculature because it's really important that we do train this in the gym. Um, I don't expect anyone, I suppose, to leave here knowing all these muscle groups, uh, but I, I want you to gain a, a very thorough appreciation for them and what we're trying to achieve in the gym. 
If we look at our core system, um, I want you to think about like an onion layer. Okay, so if our spine is the core of the onion, we have layer upon layer. Okay, so we can strip this back. Okay, so we look at the rectus abdominis, but to be honest, they're just your beach muscles. They're your six pack, and I don't really train a lot of that in the gym. Uh, what I look at is deeper layers. I look at the transverse abdominis and the internal obliques here because these muscles are vital to produce rotation. Okay, so you want to be able to train these muscle groups in the gym. Okay, so improving core, should we perform static core exercises? So should we be doing a whole lot of planking in the gym? Or should we be performing dynamic core exercises, whether that be medicine ball throws, uh, resistant band exercises, maybe some dynamic Pilates exercises? Um, I think it's vital that we need to be able to control movement before we can actually generate movement. Okay, so I think that we need to be training both, both systems here that in your golf swing, if, you are, if you're unable to actually control that movement coming down, then dynamically you're going to fail. Okay, so uh, I think what Matt was saying uh, before is that, and I suppose I've spoken to you know, Tim about this a lot here, is that as I'm coming down, at the end of the day, we just need to be able to strike the golf ball, okay? But if you, in this position coming down, if you're failing to control rotation, then at the last minute, just to make contact with the ball, because most of us will be able to just strike, the last minute you will dip down with your hand or your shoulder will collapse, or you'll do a, a maladaptive trick movement, if you like, just to strike the ball. Um, what we need to be able to do is actually control that rotation, rotation dynamically the whole time into that position, so then we're actually just striking the ball directly where we want it. There should be no excess movement at any one time. Um, so I think, and I suppose like if I look at from an athletic development point at RSA as well, both a lot of the, the year sevens and eights probably really working with static core exercises just to be able to control their own body weight. And once you learn to control your own body weight statically, then we can move into more dynamic core exercises. I think the 11 and 12s and, and senior athletes should be always constantly working statically to learn to control their movement and then um, dynamically as well to be able to generate power and generate force. Um, so once again, I'll just take it away uh, layers. Um, internal obliques, um, and we look at the external obliques. If you look at the internal obliques, um, I remember it, and I've spoken to the kids here, that hands in your pocket, okay, for internal. Uh, so we look at the orientation of, of the fibres that are going in, in, inwards. Um, and then we look at the orientation of the external obliques, which is more horizontal. So, um, the internal obliques are same side rotators. So, for example, um, if I'm a right handed golfer, as I'm coming down, my left obliques here are gen generating the force to strike the ball. My external obliques on the right hand side, once again, are generating the force to strike the ball through here. Okay, so internal obliques are always same side generators. The external obliques on the opposite side assist in that movement. Once again, I don't expect you to remember it, but these are the type of things that you know, Matt and I will think about when we're actually writing programs and going, okay, well, what muscle groups do we need to actually recruit and achieve to be able to um, generate rotatory power for our athletes? Um, I find that this is um, really important, especially when it comes to preventing injury. Eccentric control, so I think a lot of the time we're constantly going, okay, well, how much power can I actually produce? We also need to be able to slow our body down. But what's, what's stopping me when I strike the ball, taking three or four steps, or literally just falling face down? So our body will also work. So I've talked about internal obliques as the same side generator. So this is working, my internal obliques on this side are actually working to slow my body down, okay, on this side. So it's the opposite muscle. So it's, it's vital that we do that um, because the ability to decelerate and stabilise the spine against forces that twist it is critical to preventing spinal injury. So once again, if we think about the, the golfers in RSA, um, you know, we might be doing a medicine ball throw, and we can talk about you know, generating power. Well, it's also important to actually learn to be able to catch the ball, store energy. Can they release the ball, but then also learn to decelerate? 
because if they don't, they're then just going to twist through their gears or their knee going to collapse in because they can't actually learn to decelerate their body as well. So I think we also need to think about rotatory power, but how well we actually control that and can quickly decelerate our body. So, so if our obliques are inefficient, then our ability to absorb, so if I have inefficient obliques, our ability to absorb um, rotation in that position, disperse and release our forces are going to be altered, right? consequently leading to altered rotatory power in golfers. If we have altered force control, it is a catalyst for tightness, for stiffness and decreased range of motion, which ultimately and potentially can lead to injury. Okay. The other little bit of food for thought is the lack of proximal stabilisation in our core decreases optimal distal mobility in our shoulders. So for example, if, if I, once again I'm, I'm lining up, if I have really good control through my pel uh, pelvis, I'll just jump to here, if I have really good um, control through my pelvis, then I'm actually able to produce more mobility through my thoracic spine and my shoulders. But if I'm, I suppose, weak and unstable through my pelvis and I'm falling into strange positions, I can't get up far into these positions, okay? So, once again, I want you to think about, um, you know, creating a, a solid foundation for your pelvis to achieve um, mobility higher up. So if I was to sort of summarise what my section was, we must train the whole body to create rotation from the ground up. So I want you to think about the spiral of the staircase, okay, working from ankles, knees, hips, lumbar spine, thoracic, shoulder blade, shoulder, and working all the way up in this um, staircase format. We need deep abdominals, right, as well as our glutes are imperative for rotation. So probably something that, you know, I, when I was talking about your obliques working for rotation, it's very important, obviously, that the power comes through um, my glute as well. So we must track that as well. And the ability to decelerate and stabilise the spine is just as important as generating rotatory power. Yes, we must train both in the gym. Okay. Um, before I move on, does anyone have any questions at all for both Matt and myself? Just one of the early graphs you showed about changing behaviours to get to a certain point. Um, muscle memory sort of type of, um, it's another phrase for, for that yeah. type of thing. Um, historically it's been, you know, talk about 500 to 1,000 bits of a golf ball for it to become muscle memory. Have you got any expansion on that? Yeah, so the, the, the body and the brain is incredibly complicated in the way it works. A lot of the times those skills can be changed actually instantly if the body is compensating for something, if that makes sense. So the movement correction centre, if you like, actually sits below your brain. So if you ever tried to change something in your golf swing and you're okay, I'm going to do this, and then you line up to hit it, and then as soon as you start hit, you're swinging that golf stick, something happens and you can't do what you're trying to achieve. The, the movement correction centre actually sits below the brain and it's sort of receiving feedback from the body below it. So like I talked about that ankle example, if you free up the ankle, you could potentially change that skill instantly because the body goes, okay, I, I, I'm happy to do that now. I'm happy to transfer my weight forward another foot. So it's it's not as black and white. I remember when I first went through my undergraduate degree, someone said it takes it takes 1,000 repetitions to learn a movement skill. It takes 10,000 repetitions to relearn a faulty skill. It's nowhere near that black and white. It, it depends on why the skill is compensating. And you know, even when you look at that, that blocks versus random practice, idea that's up on the screen now it's going to depend on the person it's going to depend on the way their body moves the way their body works how their brain processes information unfortunately i don't have an easy answer for you yeah, so it's good, i guess that's another use one of the myths is that sort of been that idea has been developed as of recently was that sort of accepted when you were doing your undergrad that it takes you know a thousand times to memorize the most movement yeah, I would like to say that was recently, but I did my undergraduate in 2000, I graduated from that in 2010, so it was 2008 that, that I got told that. So sometime in the last eight years, that shifted fairly significantly, I guess, with a, a better understanding of how the, the, the brain works, I suppose, and applying. Even, I mean, you look at that research, so yeah, that's from 1979, and a lot of those concepts didn't really get applied to skill acquisition until very recently, to be honest. But yeah, it's been a bit of a shift. 
Beautiful. All right, well, what we're going to do now then, we've got a couple of thank yous to make, I believe. Yes, we do. <laughs> Uh, so just quickly what we do, obviously we've got the rehabilitation, strength, training, uh, athletic development side of what we do. We've obviously got a Pilates centre as well. We'll take you down and show you all the heart pump centre. More importantly, we click the next one. We just want to thank our, our sponsors, which you've got little goodie bags there. There's a lot of things in that, in terms of door prizes and things that, that helped us put on the night. So we've got Earth Choice, um, by Nature's Organic, Cool Core, Barry Plant, Real Estate. We've got a couple more, I believe, I'll put one for me. Oh, <laughs> we've got Whole Food Ventures, so we've also got Miss Golf Knox as well, which um, have, have helped contribute to our, our goodie bags, but also we've got raffles going on and things like that too, which will happen later. So what we're going to do now is we're going to head down to our gym. Uh, we're going to take you through a couple of sample exercises of, of things that we would do, uh, which are going to be a really nice one because I'll be able to show you an example of how I can see what you do in the golf swing from an exercise. Um, and then we've got some food and some drinks and stuff going on. Okay, so you